I'm going to take um, the liberty of actually asking the first question, if I might. And and what I'd like to do, Terry, I'll, I'll address this first to you and then ask the other panelists to respond from their perspectives as well. You know, throughout the, each of the um, panelists, I think in one level or another, talked about the concept of compensation for livestock predation and financial compensation to, to, um, to ranchers who, who have cattle or sheep um, depredated. My question to you would be, you know, is, is that, um, you know, I think the assumption around the, the room is that that is a very helpful and, and will, will help move the dialogue with the ranching community to a more positive place. Is that your perspective? And I guess I would, would follow that with the other, to the other panelists uh, who've had experience with these programs in other states or in other regions, if there's a sense that those, uh, that compensation has been effective in helping to um, sway some of the ranching community to be more favorable towards, towards wolves or towards reintroduction. Terry? Well, I mean, it's a good question, and I don't know that it's a simple question or a consistent answer. You'll hear different things from ranchers. Um, one is, is they'll tell you that they don't put the time and energy into the livestock, and they have varied types of livestock that they produce, some for feeding the world, some for reproduction, some for other things. Um, some will tell you that they don't put the, the equity and the time and the, the hours in to, to lose those animals to something like depredation. Um, albeit it happens. I mean, mountain lions, bear, things along those lines still happen. So some will tell you that, and they, they mean that. Um, some will tell you that they have not seen a compensation, and we would, we would edify this, that they haven't seen a compensation program that works. There's quite a bit of research done on cortisol levels and, and uh, performance and uh, um, reproductive rates as well as pasture utilization and several other things related to livestock performance, um, which has a financial impact that is hard to quantify. Um, and then there's the difficulty in confirming a wolf kill that seems to be an issue um, and then there's you know the, the actual confirmation that happens so while I think it's one of the tools in the toolbox I don't know at least in Colorado and it may have been in other places and I interact with those ranchers frequently in these other states but <clears throat> it just it appears to me that that's not been a well answered question and that's why you will hear that there really isn't a meaningful wolf compensation program. And, you know, specifically to what Colorado has the ability to pay for, I can assure you there won't be a meaningful compensation program in Colorado based on the significant um, lack of resources that Colorado has to allocate these things through the General Assembly of which I'm fairly intimately knowledgeable about because I sat in those committee meetings every week of every year for the last 20 years. I would like to respond their perspectives on this topic. Or, yeah, go ahead. Uh, whether compensation is uh, right or wrong or good or bad, it's absolutely fair. You have to do your best to recognize the taking of private rights. We, we know from good data that there are kills that are never detected. So a compensation program has to be adjusted upward to account for undetected kills. We know in situations where, at least from Montana, a ranch suffers depredations, it's typical that calves will not gain normal weight following that event. So you should also consider adjusting upward for weight not gain. Uh, I, I'm proud of Montana's program. As a sitting senator, uh, I sat on committees for years and voted to support funding to help account for the infrequent depredations that occur. You, you saw the data that Dr. Boyd presented. It's the atypical wolf that kills livestock. But if you're the rancher that has suffered the losses, you have a problem and it should be
corrected, especially when that problem takes place on private land. It's, I think, an entirely different discussion when that depredation takes place on public land. But right or wrong, good or bad, compensation is fair and should be deployed. Others want to respond to that? Yeah. I'll just add one thing is that uh, I think last year it was 82,000 or so compensated for wolves. It was about 30, 35,000 for lions. It's rel relatively new to compensate for lions. And it was 133,000, if I remember right, for grizzly bears. So it's not, it's not just wolves. There's lots of predators out there, and it does need to be really thought out. And Colorado has to really decide how to handle it before wolves get here. Yeah, I would just comment that um, with the Yellowstone reintroduction, I, I think it was uh, very, very wise of Defenders of Wildlife to step in and think of this guy, Hank Fisher's idea to provide compensation in the United States, picked it up. But, um, you know, one of the things that, that we found when we got a chance to come back 10 years later and survey people, while uh, the support for wolf recovery in the resident population and in the visit, visitor population was was fairly stable, wasn't significantly different. Uh, the, the ranching community went down by about half. So it was very you know, polarized and also hunting. I, I'm a lifelong hunter myself, but I'm happy to have the wolf, but not everybody feels that way. So there's something going on with the ranchers that we can maybe learn from Yellowstone that we So the next question um, opens up the question about uh, wildlife management by the ballot box. And, and the, this particular question asks if there's a double-edged sword here. And I'll read this question directly, but as I'm reading it, you might also think um, if there's other thoughts about this approach to wildlife management, if, they, if the panelists here are generally supportive of that direction or, or want to express some concerns. We've heard a little bit about that already. The, the question as written is, how does opening up the introduction to be decided by the public create opportunities for other states to vote to remove certain species from protection? Um, so it's a hypothetical question, but you know, it just in, maybe more broadly in terms of that or, or other issues with respect to management by the ballot box. I have thought long about the strengths and weaknesses of direct democracy. It's not necessarily the way to move some issues forward. If you take a hard look at 107, it acknowledges the authority of the General Assembly. It acknowledges the authority of the Commission. It acknowledges the scientific expertise of CPW. It acknowledges the importance of scientific data on biological, ecological, and economic and social issues. And, and, and it acknowledges the importance of citizen participation. All of that is nested in 107. For heaven's sakes, at least read it. I, it's good legislation. It fundamentally says to Coloradans, do you want wolves to be part of your future? If you do, vote yes. If you don't, vote no. If you vote yes, you're, you're telling your employees, go do their jobs well. This will be, will be done by CPW. This is not wildlife management at the ballot box. 107 does not answer all of the questions that attend wolf restoration. It simply says, we got good people in this state, they can come up with answers, and we expect them to move forward. It is a good approach uh, that has been uh, now uh, presented because for 25 years, the federal government has moved and, and this speaks nothing to changing a species designation. This doesn't touch on how gray wolves are considered by federal law or state law. It, it, that's not the vote. The vote is, do you want a science-based restoration plan that relies on reintroductions to be implemented by your professional biologists and your general assembly? That's all it says. In that regard, it does a good job stitching together the strength of direct democracy which is as American as mom, apple pie, and baseball, and the strength of good science. Terry? 
So just an attempt, because the person took time to write it down to answer the question. Um, I, I don't think in any state in the union, if they have an initiative process, they're going to be able to delist a federally listed species. That's not going to happen. That is a governed issue by the Endangered Species Act and a process that takes place there. Um, some states, actually Colorado doesn't have an Endangered Species Act. It has a list of endangered species um, and it talks about the interest in those species of concern um, as well. But, you know, I don't, I think the question is, you know, do we have, so the ballot in, in this case is all about shades of gray. It doesn't allow a full um, litany of responses from the general, from, from parks and wildlife. It, it narrows that. In, in essence, it says you shall reintroduce the species. It doesn't say you may. It says you shall. And in legal tenants, that's, those are very different words. Um, yes, it does give some allowance, uh, and in fact, a great deal of allowance as to the breadth of that management and introduction. Um, it, uh, it does provide for the ability for the General Assembly to provide compensation within the means that they may provide compensation. And in, in, in many ways, the horse is pushing the wagon in this case, um, which is, which you know, is 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 fine, it, but it likely isn't the best way of of managing any species. And you know, I just harken back to my my prior comment that while those duly elected officials have a very difficult and challenging job. Um, it is very difficult for them to prioritize all the issues they have and to be able to go back in and be dynamically flexible in adjusting what the citizens of Colorado did through a ballot initiative for the betterment of a species is highly unlikely in Colorado. And the proof is in the pudding, if you will, because they've never done it. Anyone else want to respond to that one? Okay, John. Um, I'll just say that's a really tough question. Um, and I, I think of it in maybe a little different context if the model is, you know, an agency making reasoned judgments. And it kind of goes to the theme of this conference of, uh, I think the question is out there is, as uh, Human Dimensions uh, folks at Social Science has done our job, are we actually giving good advice? Are we Take it serious, do we make a difference? And you know, the model, I didn't get very far on talking about the Yellowstone experience, but one of the key things is this sort of will of the people, this uh, passive use thing where people care that they exist. And how are you going to figure that out? So, the way we did it, typically, is you look to the model that World Wildlife Funds, the Federal Wildlife provide. You ask people a hypothetical donation. And we've done some other studies setting up real trust funds, comparing it to these hypothetical. And uh, one of our big samples was uh, Life of Fanglers in Montana. It's a great database. Uh, we had a kind of a shocking finding that uh, fishermen are liars. <laughs> I don't want to break it to you, but uh, they typically, the control sample, say ten dollars excuse me and uh, you know we get five cash in the mail from people that we actually ask for money now that's not a bad take and it's a good business to get into but uh, so in Yellowstone we, we calibrated for that based on our prior studies that we've done in cooperation with Nature Conservancy and then later set trial and limited uh, we set up Rocky Mountain Station was in on one of them EPA or the other but it, it kind of goes back to, are we giving them good advice? Can they take it seriously? And this, this passive use thing is a really big tool and really swings things, plus or minus on decisions. Uh, what the Nobel Laureate panel came up with was the simple recommendation that if you are going to ask these kind of questions, do it in the context of a referendum. Ask people, how would you vote if there is a referendum on this issue? And this is what it's going to cost you, which I see that as sort of quite a big initiative. So I'll have that for another meeting. Okay. Take it up.
So um, for the next, I'm gonna I'm going to present you two different questions together because I think they're 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 related in a way, and and they they speak to kind of the the dual issues of ecological and biological uh, issues and management, as well as the social science components and and the human dimensions elements of, of this issue. So the first one is um, the, the, the questioner asked if the panel would talk more about what social, excuse me, social acceptance looks like in Colorado. And if a reintroduction is going to take place, what actions should be taken to, um, to provide more, so, to, to move social acceptance of this issue in the state? And then the other question asks, what policy and land management research needs to be done in Colorado before reintroduction happens. Diane, you kind of looked like maybe you were wanting to answer that one. <laughs> I am not the social dimensions person, but I can tell you from experience, so most of my job now is the social dimension. And I think, I don't see a hunter up here. Um, the hunting community in Montana is very strong. I'm a hunter myself. I've been hunting in Montana for 40 years. Um, people have concerns and we don't have the, the data to put out there in a form that they can digest. So that to me is a big concern, to be able to touch your public, they're supporting all the state employees, the whole programs with their fees, is to make an effort to reach out, especially on your, where your wild ungulate populations are at. I know, because I'm on the inside and I said, oh, yeah, deer and elk have been slowly climbing up in the last two winters, they've been going down, we've had hard winters, is it wolf, is it winter? Now we got CWD, there's a lot of things out there, but I don't think that word is getting out. John, I mean, you live in Montana, but I think information out that's straightforward and transparent, um, ecologically, dealing with hunting, the livestock industry is very important in the state of Montana as it is here. The big difference, I was thinking about that, um, livestock industry has wildlife services, you have compensation programs. There's a lot of things in place at some level for some assistance. And hunters, if wolves get an elk that they think is theirs, they don't feel compensated. You know, I mean, it's just, it's a different, there's no background, there's no backing for hunters to have a reward of having wolves kill them. What they perceive is their animals. Yeah, I, I agree. I think you know, that, that was the one other thing that we saw change uh, between the 1991 and 1993 versus 2005. Um, in addition to the, to the ranching community, the hunting community also came much more forward. They, they supported the level 55, 60 percent hunters. Favorite wolf recovery during 1991 survey that was around 35, 40. Mm -hmm. So there's something going on. And, one manifestation of it that maybe I don't know if Mike would speak to this. Um, I, I grew up in, uh, well, my sister's got old enough for high school. I still resent that. We had to move to Thompson Fall, the western part of the state, um, to get somewhat educated. It didn't work out too well. But, uh, anyway, uh, I grew up in Sanders County, a very, very conservative place. I fit in well there, I guess. Um, but, uh, Legislators from there actually proposed a, a, a wolf bounty. They were kind of upset about uh, not getting to shoot an elk where he's used to it. And, um, Diane, I was kind of impressed that the Fish Wildlife Park did a study down in Bitterroot where the same thing was happening in Westport. And didn't they find that it was more of a lion's meal out there? So I think that's the kind of message that needs to get out. But maybe Mike and Mike will tell us about these. I would just I would add to what John says is they did a study and it showed and another study showed that the lions and bears take more elk than wolves and it got into Montana magazine but when you talk to a hunter and you tell me of three times as many lions in Montana they say yeah but the wolves are killing all the game it's like so there's some disconnect that's my point there's a disconnect and I'd love to figure it out. Um on the notion of what you can do to promote social acceptance is a great question. If you, if you take a fair read of Initiative 107 and, and then would follow up and insist that it be implemented while assuming that Coloradans pass it, uh, it, would, it would 
ensure it would it would ensure that gray wolves were not the big burden that they're imagined to be. 107 is good on nearly all of the issues that wolf recovery touches on. It is especially mindful of ranching and farming. It is largely silent on, on big game. And, and it's silent on big game because if you take a fair look at big game hunting, uh, it's nearly all done for recreational reason, principally. The subsistence hunter is an uncommon individual these days. It's a recreational activity based on a public resource. And at least in Colorado, it was quite abundant. The state's got good survey data. There's plenty of deer and elk to go around. And you look to the Northern Rockies as an analog for what Colorado's future might be. There's a rich big game hunting industry in the three states, despite the fact that there are 2,000 gray wolves on the ground. Montana, Wyoming, Idaho continue to report record seasons for deer and elk. Wolf recovery has not upset the big game hunt, hunting apple cart in the, in the northern Rocky Mountains. And, and, and it is a public resource that is pursued, if people are going to be honest, if you come up empty handed and you go home without a deer in the back of your truck, you're likely not going to go hungry. It doesn't mean that you don't like eating venison, I understand that, and I hunt too. But it's different than ranching. Ranching is a livelihood. Now, I understand outfitters make a livelihood hunting, taking people hunting. I, I understand all of that. Uh, but at the end of the day, it's always struck me that uh, big game and gray wolves and livestock and gray wolves are apples and oranges. But to your original question, 107 answers if you do it well. So, so I'd like to say something briefly. I'm also a lifelong hunter and the faculty advisor for the backcountry hunters and anglers chapter at CSU. And Heather and I hunt the, for the simple reason we'd like to know where our meat comes from. But as a good friend of mine reminds me over and over again, Rick, that's why it's called hunting, not shooting. And so I definitely see the connection that Mike was making. For a rancher, it's the livelihood. It's their job. And for the hunters, with exceptions, as Mike alluded to, it's hunting. It may not always be shooting. Final comment for me is there are a lot more hunters in the state of Montana than there are ranchers, and every one of them is armed. And they can do a lot of just, you know, misjustice to wolves out there if they want, not necessarily report it, not necessarily get caught. I'm not saying it happens, I'm just saying there's a very important contingency of people out there that hunt because they love our wildlife in Montana, and a lot of them I talk to even love wolves. They see them as part of the ecosystem. They, they bring them in, they harvest them, I tag them for them. But I'm just saying, they need to be listened to. And I, I just, that's all I'm gonna say. Can I get anything to add? Get you to say one more thing? <laughs> um, I think something that maybe the hunters noticed, they didn't notice the West Fork, but maybe they noticed uh, we can't get a cow tag that North the Elks gun anymore. And I'm just have to follow the literature, but I was amazed to see that the, both the Park Service <coughs> colleges Disagree. They can't explain the big climbing elk. Do you understand? Anything final? <laughs> when, 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 in 1994, 1995, when we began the Wolf Project in Yellowstone, you could not walk across the park's northern range. Imagine the park is a great big square in the northern quarter. It's an ec ecologically unique setting for the park. It's it's a relatively low elevation montane rangelands, great ungulate habitat summer and winter, very different than the rest of the park, which is high plateau country. There were 19,000 elk on the northern range in 92, 93, 94, entirely too many elk. Montana had a long standing request to the park service, sort of stop mismanaging your elk. There are too many, you need to affect a culling program. Well, the park service had a different approach and said no, no to culling. When gray wolves were brought back, uh, they started killing elk, but concomitant with that was an increase in the richness and the robustness of the carnivore guild. Cougars became more common, grizzly bears became more common, black bears stayed steady, coyotes bounced back after declining. The late season hunt continued outside the northern portion of the park. There was a lot of pressure on that northern range herd. It declined, and Dr. Vucic, sitting right here, did a beautiful paper that said if you take a hard look at the, at the herd, probably, the factor that, that describes its trajectory best is drought. So of course there's lots of things going on with that northern range herd. 
nobody questioned the wisdom of it, of, it, of, it, of it being too large and it needed to be reduced in size. The northern range was certainly overbrowsed, may well have been overbrowsed. So John's right, there is no late season hunt on a gardener now, and it did upset people because it be had become their honey hole. But the, the park doesn't exist, or public lands don't exist to necessarily float somebody's preferred recreational activity. It has to achieve many ends. And the story of the Northern Range herd is a great deal more complicated than simply uh, wolf predation. So the next question I, I ask with, with a bit of trepidation in all sincerity, because as, as far as I know, there's no one on the panel that has strong Native American heritage. But, but there's a question here that relates to that. And I thought, especially, you know, given the importance and strength of Native American culture in Montana, perhaps, perhaps there's some knowledge and experience there. And, and if others have, have other thoughts on this. And the, the question really relates to the fact that, you know, as we've looked at various issues with wildlife and endangered species and reintroduction, um, for many of us, the the tight linkages of many of these species to Native American culture um, has become has become clear to us. It's been clear to others for a long time, I'm sure. And we experienced that uh, outside of uh, Fort Collins with the introduction of bison. The question with respect to wolves in is, you know, the the connection between Native American populations and wolf reintroduction. And maybe maybe the our our um, panelists from Montana can speak to if they, they have experiences in observing how that played out in Montana and if there's thoughts about if there's some special issues there in Colorado that we need to be thinking about as we're having this discussion. Uh, there was a strong tribal contingent in the park when the wolves arrived celebrating their presence. The Nez Perce tribe uh, affected the program in Idaho. We've got wonderful teammates from the Mexican Wolf Recovery Program. Some of the tribes in the Southwest are participating. Some are oppositional. Uh, not long ago, I met with the Southern Ute Tribal Council. I told them everything that, that I knew. They deserve to be spoken to quietly and privately. Uh, their creation story rests on the back of a great wolf. Uh, I don't know what the Tribal Council will do. I don't know if they'll support or oppose. But of course the Native American voice matters, and it, it has in the past, sometimes expressing support, sometimes expressing opposition. I think we all belong to Mike's tribe of old white men and women. <laughs> I don't pretend to speak for the natives, I'm not going to. But I can tell you they do harvest wolves um, on the reservations on the flatted south of Kalispell, and they do raise livestock, and there are depredation issues, and he's kind of like anybody else in terms of how my awareness is, but I can't speak from a Native American perspective. I'm not going to pretend to. Yeah, well, I, I just observed that, unfortunately, usually the Native Americans are the last one consulted with. I mean, I kind of mentioned uh, work in the Grand Canyon. Canyon flows, and you know, we've been well myself and then before me, you know, team out of Wisconsin. We've been doing surveys down there for about 20 years, national surveys on the value of protecting the humpback chub, sediment conservation, and so on. Um, we've done white water boaters. We've done pale water fisheries on people on the on lower Grand Canyon for rainbows. Survey in the field of the Navajo. Uh, we've been meeting with the Hopi and the Zuni. I've worked a lot with the Hopi on some other issues and uh, the Boal tribe. So they're kind of I'm very last on the list as far as the social science that I've seen for natural resources. Um, if a person is really interested in this, uh, a few years back uh, there was a lot of controversy in Alaska about aerial gunning of wolves and also how they were handling bears. And clearly there, it's, it's not just recreational hunting, the subsistence is huge, plus the cultural factor. Um, so we were on this National Academy of Sciences panel and there's a, there's a big book out there that we all wrote that includes the economics and we, we went to the villages. And, and I worked up there on that 
some deputies and the colonels for all those voyages. So I have some feel for it and I published on how you value those things. Yeah, because that's out there and you look at it and you don't find stuff. So they want to go to them. Those of you who have worked with me know that I'm always completely committed to starting and ending on time, particularly when beer and food await on the other end of a, of a meeting. Um, so with that, um, I'd like to thank Becky Nymack and Mike Manfredo, Wes White, all those who were involved in putting this, this wonderful event this afternoon together. I'm sure there's lots of you out there that I'm not sure who they are, but thank you for, so much for that. But especially thank you to our wonderful panel who really, I think, presented some terrific insights into this issue. And um, again, I'd encourage you to continue this dialogue with one another and with the panelists uh, as the evening and the, and the week goes on. So with that, please join me in thanking our panelists. <laughs>